Don Early for our webinar today titled Preclinical Imaging with Fluorescence in Vivo Endomicroscopy. We'll start the webinar at exactly 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, which is in about four or five minutes. Thank you. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by Syntica Instrumentation. My name is Martin Hess and I will be your host for today. A brief thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to attend our session titled Preclinical Imaging with Fluorescence in Vivo Endomicroscopy. During our webinar today, we will provide a comprehensive overview of the latest laser confocal microscope technology called the 5-2 from OptiScan Imaging. And the session will include, amongst other things, a hands-on demonstration of the system and an overview of various preclinical applications supported by sample images from a variety of animal models and tissue types. Your presenter today is Dr. Mohamed Ayaz Rangrez, an in vivo microscopy product manager at Syntica Instrumentation. Dr. Rangres completed his PhD with a focus on preclinical drug discovery biology and a specialization in microscopy. In addition to his four years of teaching microscopy, Ayaz also worked for e-learning and as a presenter for various YouTube educational programs. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly mention a few housekeeping items. We will be recording today's webinar and we'll make the video available for download following the event. We will also be holding a brief question and answer session following the formal presentation, so please submit questions via the Q&A dialog box, and we'll get to as many questions as possible in the time allotted. If we are unable to answer all questions during the Q&A session, we will reply privately, and we'll also prepare uh, written responses for distribution to all participants. We do have a lot of material to cover today, so without any further delay, I'm going to pass things over to Ayaz to begin his presentation. So Ayaz, whenever you're ready, uh, please uh, please begin. Thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today and uh, welcome to the fluorescent site. And I apologize for this uh, bad scientific meme, but uh, this entire one hour discussion is about the fluorescence microscopy. So welcome to the fluorescent site. So uh, when I prepared this presentation, um, I wanted to talk uh, dedicatedly about this uh, fluorescence in vivo endomicroscopy. And so I had to make some assumptions like, uh, you know, what is uh, the normal microscopy techniques, uh, uh, especially the fluorescence and confocal microscopy. So with this background, uh, let's discuss what we are going to talk today. So we will begin with uh, some background about the fluorescence microscopy and what is fluorescence in vivo endomicroscopy and what is confocal laser endomicroscopy. Once we develop this theoretical background, uh, uh, I'll give you a practical demonstration of the instruments uh, about uh, what are the different parts of the instrument and what are their functions. Um, I'll also give you a quick tour of the software and we will try and perform some imaging with uh, the samples that we have available, uh, including the XY imaging, and we will try and capture some optical sections and perform the uh, image analysis. After that, we will talk about the applications of uh, this fluorescence in vivo endomicroscopy uh, for cancer, microvasculature, skeletal imaging. 
And in the last and the small section, I'll talk about the safety and troubleshooting. And at the end, I'll quickly summarize uh, what we have discussed today. So now before we begin, um, let me first understand uh, how often are you using fluorescence microscopy uh, so that we can summarize or we can emphasize uh, onto different aspects. So I'll quickly launch a poll uh, and it would take about uh, 30 seconds to complete. Uh, so if you can vote onto this poll, so. Mm -hmm. So we are getting some interesting results here uh, and it looks like most of you are using uh, fluorescence microscopy on weekly or monthly basis. And yeah, at least a quarter of you are using them, using it on daily basis. So I'm a bit relieved because most of you are now uh, familiar with the microscopy. So I'll, I'll quickly summarize uh, the background about fluorescence microscopy. So we know that bright field microscopy, it's the essential tool in biomedical research. You cannot imagine any biomedical laboratory without the uh, light microscope. Uh, but the limitation of light microscope is uh, it is not able to offer a sufficient contrast. So that's why it's called as bright field. And uh, you have to use um, some stains and other things, uh, other measures of developing the contrast. Then we have dark field microscopy such as fluorescence microscopy. And because of the phenomenon of fluorescence, it gives you really high uh, contrast. And the next step in the evolution of uh, dark field or fluorescence microscopy was confocal microscopy as it offered uh, much sharper, much crisper images because it eliminated out of focus light. And I mean, in 2014, the Nobel Prize was awarded for super resolution microscopy. And in last 10 years, uh, this new technique has evolved so much that it's now nearing to the uh, electron microscopy in its resolution. Now, despite all the advantages of this uh, bench of fluorescence microscopy, like resolution, really high uh, uh, contrast, for in vivo imaging, you always have to go through the sample preparation. You have to harvest the tissue, fix it, process it. Uh, you have to give some dyes, uh, like for those who are working with pathology, you are giving hematoxyl and eosin. Those who are performing fluorescence microscopy, you have to go for IHC or use some other types of stains. So it's a lot of process that that, that is involved with that and uh, it may induce artifacts. So that's the reason why Benchtop microscopy, though if it is offering high resolution, uh, the sample preparation is always tedious and it's also frustrating. Like uh, during my PhD, I had to spend like two years with in vivo imaging. And many times my experiments failed because uh, the tissue preparation, there was some artifacts with that. So scientists, they are trying to image uh, the samples uh, in vivo. And till now, the techniques that were available was like intravital microscopy. So what you do is basically you bring the animal onto the microscope stage. Uh, but it's, again, a lot of problem with this because uh, you have to prepare the animal for this imaging. And it's a very unflexible method. So you have only some vascular and uh, skin or intestinal imaging protocols. So in vivo imaging is really problematic with the benchtop microscopy. So if you want to go for in vivo imaging, you have to go for other options like MRI, PET, or uh, CT scan. Now this images, uh, this type of imaging techniques, uh, they give you in vivo imaging. You don't have to kill the animal. Uh, sorry, you don't have to sacrifice the animal. Uh, and you can image the live animal for, I mean, even for longitudinal studies. But the problem here is you don't get any cellular details. So as a preclinical biologist, we know that you need to understand what is the tissue architecture, what is happening to the cells, because ultimately that will determine the function of the organ and function of the, of the entire system. So you have to see those cells in action, but you can't do that in vivo easily with the benchtop microscopy. So if you compare these two scenarios, on one side, you have MRI-like non-invasive techniques, but they do not offer you resolution. On the other side, you have techniques like benchtop microscopy, confocal laser scanning microscopy. They offer you really good resolution, but they are highly invasive. So this confocal laser endomicroscopy, it's combining the best of both the worlds. So it's minimally invasive. That means uh, you put down a probe inside the animal and that will start capturing the images and you can all perform the in vivo imaging and the resolution will be similar to the benchtop microscope. 
So let me give you the example here of this uh, video. So it was obtained from live animals. Can we do that with fluorescence or confocal microscope? No, we cannot do that because you have to sacrifice the animal. Can we do that with the MRI PET? The problem will be the resolution. You won't be getting any cellular details. So you can do that with the techniques like laser confocal endomicroscopy because you are putting down the probe in the animal and that probe will capture the images. And that probe is connected to the uh, to the confocal processor which will uh, process the images. And this video was captured with uh, five technologies. So that is fluorescence in vivo endomicroscopy. And I'm sure by the end of your presentation, you will learn that uh, these types of uh, videos will be captured only with uh, five technology. Now, apart from uh, all this uh, complications with benchtop and MRI techniques where you require a dedicated operator, FITO technology is very simple and anyone who is working with preclinical model, uh, they can use this tool. And it comes with a very simple probe. And when you bring it, bring this probe in contact with the uh, with the tissue, it will start performing imaging. So it's super easy to use. And the goal of our this, our webinar is to, uh, is to impart this knowledge that how easy this instrument is in operation. So, just like a classical confocal microscope, uh, this instrument also follows the same optical train of lasers, detectors, uh, lenses. So the laser is uh, 488 nanometer, and this laser is pumped down through a chain of lenses uh, and into the optical fiber. And from that optical fiber, it is focused into your uh, specimen. And the resulting fluorescence is collected back by the same fiber, and then it goes to the detector and detector captures the emission above 515 nanometer. And just like our confocal microscope, any light that comes out of the plane, that means above the plane or below the plane, it is omitted through the confocal principle. And the scanning mechanism is uh, fitted into the probe itself. So you can see that uh, scanning mechanism will allow you to perform the imaging like the laser scanning confocal microscope. So it's, the principle is uh, the same like that of the confocal microscope. And because of this fiber, it can be combined with a probe and it goes endoscopically. So that is the reason why it is given the name laser confocal endomicroscopy because it is using laser. It is combining the uh, technology of uh, confocal systems and it performs endoscopical uh, microscopy. So that's why this LCE. So you will find a lot of articles in the literature with this uh, laser confocal endomicroscopy technology. And if you see the probe, the probe is uh, really thin. It's about four millimeter in diameter, uh, comparable to a matchstick. And the place where the probe comes in contact with the sample, it is considered as uh, the depth zero. And from that depth zero, you can go deeper into the tissue uh, using the controls in the software. Now there are three different types of probes available with this instrument. So you, depending upon your requirement, you can decide uh, what type of uh, probe you want. And with this uh, Z imaging, just like your classical confocal microscope, uh, it is also an optical sectioning device. So you can perform normal XY imaging. So anything that is out of plane from the upper or lower regions, it will turn dark. And you can also go for performing series of uh, optical sections and you can go almost up till 400 micrometer in depth. Now this depth uh, is dependent upon tissues. So for some tissues, you can go uh, really deep. Uh, for the tissues which are rich in hemoglobin or other pigments, the penetration depth is less. So compared to classical, um, microscopy where uh, we are obtaining transfer sections or longitudinal sections. Uh, with this technique, basically you are performing end-phase imaging or horizontal imaging. So you put down the probe uh, onto the face of the tissue and then it will start capturing the images. So for example, it captures image at the first where you can see the intestinal villi cells. Uh, at the second position, you can see the intestinal villi as well as some uh, interstitial tissue with blood vessels. If you go deeper down into the tissue, you can see different structures. And you can also combine all of these structures and create a 3D architecture. Uh, I'll show you that in the next slides when we are performing the practical demonstration. 
Uh, now let's uh, perform the practical part. So I'll show you how this instrument is operated. So it's not a, we are not able to perform it live. So I have pre-recorded some of the videos and then I'll show them how it works. So this entire instrument, it's a very simple uh, miniaturized instrument. So you have a confocal processor where the entire confocal technology is minimized. Uh, it generates the laser power and the laser power is pumped into this uh, probe. And from that probe, uh, it comes to the animal. And in animal stage, uh, you have the probe handler, which is basically a micro positioner. So you can uh, micro manipulate your probes position into the animal. And here you can combine all your anesthesia and other things. And all the analysis computation is performed in this computer. So this computer will keep a track of uh, your imaging. You, it will perform all the analysis you want. Now, in addition to that, uh, this instrument also comes with a foot pedal. So I know from my experience that when you are working in a lab, you are looking, working uh, late night, uh, you are alone in the lab. So on one hand, you have the animal. On other hand, you have the probe and you don't know how to uh, to capture the images. And you also don't want to touch uh, the, uh, the keypad with dirty hands. So this foot pedal actually allows you to operate some parameters of this instrument without touching the instrument. So with your foot, you can control the, uh, the penetration depth and uh, you can capture the images. Now let's see how uh, one can operate this instrument. So it's very simple. Uh, you click onto the laser power and the laser power, uh, sorry, you, quick, you click onto the power button and the laser power will be turned on. And apart from the software operation, you can also control uh, the parameters of imaging from this uh, manual mode. So from this hardware also, you can control uh, different parameters like speed or filter. So if your hands are dirty and you don't want to touch the keyboard, uh, you can use this for uh, operating the instrument. Now this instrument works on uh, 488 nanometer and one might ask uh, why we are not using any other wavelength. So selection of wavelength is uh, dependent upon two different factors, uh, such as uh, what is the wavelength uh, you are trying to decide based upon the number of fluorophores as well as the imaging depth. So if you are using red or infrared wavelength, of course you have higher penetration depth, for example, 600, 700, 800. But the problem is uh, the near red fluorophore, commercially available near red fluorophores, uh, they are very less. But if you are using uh, blue or ultra, uh, ultraviolet light, you have really high number of fluorophores. But the problem is uh, the penetration depth is low. So that is the reason why we have taken a compromised position of 488 nanometer, where we have a really decent number of fluorophores available, uh, as well as the penetration depth is almost uh, 400 uh, micrometer. So now let me show you how uh, the software runs. So I have captured some uh, screenshots of the software. So this software is super easy to operate. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have the control of the scanning mechanism and uh, the zoom mechanism. So you can see the, the zoom control over here. So depending upon your requirement, you can zoom in. On the upper left-hand corner, you have the control of the laser power. So you can decide uh, what laser power you want to use. If your fluorophore is adequate, uh, you don't have to use higher laser power, but suppose you are going for higher penetration depth and your fluorophore is not uh, having that high quantum yield, what you can do is you can use a higher laser power. It can go up till one uh, milliwatt. And from the right hand uh, upper corner, you can control the penetration depth. So this will allow you at which uh, depth you want to perform the imaging. So you can go up till 400 micrometer uh, theoretically, but practically it will depend upon the uh, tissue type. So you can decide at which plane you want to capture the images. And normally you start with the plane zero and then you go deeper as you perform the imaging. And in the lower right hand corner, we have the control over the auto brightness. Auto brightness. Uh, so it is like a classical confocal microscope that uh, depending upon your uh, signal that you are getting, uh, you can uh, decide upon the brightness. So normally it is kept on while performing imaging. 
and then the lowest corner you have uh, different types of filters so depending upon your fluorophore emission you can decide uh, what type of filter you want to use so normally uh, we start with the long pass filter uh, 515 so it will try and collect any fluorescence that that's coming after uh, 515 or 540 so this 52 instruments come uh, instrument uh, comes with uh, eight pre-installed filters uh, three of them are long pass filters so for example we have lp515 so it will it will collect all the fluorescence that's coming uh, after 515 and we also have some broad pass or band pass filters so that will allow that will allow a narrow range of uh, fluorescence to be collected and four of them are empty slots so depending upon your fluorophore requirement you can uh, pre order them now though this instrument works on single excitation uh, you can perform multicolor imaging if your fluorophores are uh, their emission is uh, well separated for example one of them is giving you uh, highest emission in 520 uh, and the other one is giving you in 560 or 570 so then you can uh, separate them well using uh, this different filters now let me show you how easy this instrument is so what i'm doing is uh, i'm applying some highlighter on my skin and then i'll uh, bring it in contact with the probe and as this highlighter contains uh, fluorescent uh, it should give me some signals some results onto the instrument so i scan on the i turn on the scanning mechanism and uh, I go to the, the imaging mode. So right now I'm at the low resolution, high speed imaging. So you can see it's at 128. Then I switch to the low speed, high resolution mode. So now you can start seeing the, uh, the cells of my skin. And it's very simple. It's nothing but just the highlighter uh, on my skin, but because that contains fluorescent, it is giving me some signal. Now I'm going deep into the tissue like uh, 20 microns and you can see the uh, the ridges of uh, my fingerprint and how the cells are organized onto that and i'm increasing a bit of laser power and i'm switching the uh, switching the filter and as you can see the image is oversaturated even at uh, 70 microwatt so i'm reducing the laser power and then i'll try and go deeper into the tissue just to see where that fingerprint ridge is originating so as I go deeper into the tissue, I can see even some cells uh, which are uh, peeling off from my skin. And basically, this ridge is like uh, 110 uh, micrometer deep into uh, my skin. So this is the beauty of this instrument that it allows you to perform very simple, very fast imaging. You just have to have a good fluorophore uh, staining protocol. So I'm coming back again using the control of the optical depth. And at 22 micron depth, it looks really good. I can see the epithelial cells of my skin. Some of them have uh, started to come out. And then I hit the capture image and then it captures the image and it, it keeps it uh, stored into the, uh, into the folder on the computer. Now again, I'm switching back to the fast speed, uh, low resolution mode, and I'm trying to find an interesting structure uh, just to show how this instrument works. So I'm scrolling around in different areas. Uh, we do the same thing for the confocal uh, microscope. So I'm seeing some uh, structures, but I want to identify where I can see some structural phenomenon, which is strikingly different from uh, the other regions of the skin. So it, it looks like something here. Um, when I initially captured this video, I was a bit worried that uh, it looks like some type of uh, mite or some type of bug onto my skin. And when I switched to the high resolution mode, then actually I could identify it as just uh, a part of my skin that has broken off. So it's super simple and yet you can get all the details that you would be getting from the uh, benchtop microscope. Now, if I want to go for benchtop microscopy, it would be a really complicated protocol. So you can see all these structures and how the, the layers of the skin, uh, they are organized. Okay, uh, this structure also looks uh, interesting. It's probably uh, an opening of the sebaceous gland or uh, sweat gland. And you can also see some debris that are associated with that. So maybe I should go and take a bath. 
Okay, but I'm sure you are interested into seeing the, the rodent imaging or preclinical imaging rather than seeing the dead skin. So before we go for that, uh, let me first understand uh, what are the animal models you are working with uh, so that uh, I can adapt uh, some, some part of this uh, presentation accordingly. So if you can quickly vote uh, what animal models you are working with. Okay, so the, mm -hmm, we are still getting some results. Okay, so almost 80% uh, of you are working with uh, mice uh, and it's a good thing because uh, we will be talking uh, plentifully about rat and mice protocols. Unfortunately, we do not have the permission to work with the live rat or mice. Uh, so what I have done is uh, we got one toy from the toy store and um, the fur of this toy, uh, it is having uh, the fibers and luckily they are giving fluorescence at uh, 488 nanometer. So what I'm doing is I'm just bringing the probe in touch with the in touch with this uh, toy and you can see it starts capturing images. So all these fibers that are about uh, 10 or 20 micrometers in diameter and you can start seeing this fiber. So what I'm trying to communicate here is uh, the instrument is really super easy to use and it depends upon uh, your protocol. Now I'm sure you are interested in seeing some real cells and uh, we did not have the permission of um, using the animals. So then I had to turn back to one of our grade 12 experiments. Uh, I'm sure all of us remember that when we took out the onion cells and we stained them with toluidine blue, methylene blue, we covered them with the cover slip and looked at under the compound microscope. So I'm trying to repeat the same experiment and instead of using methylene blue, uh, I'm using 0.1% uh, acriflavin. So the plant cells, they are difficult to stain uh, because the cell wall, uh, it hinders in the permeability. So what I had to do was uh, I had to stain them for uh, 30 minutes. And following 30 minutes, um, I removed them from the acriflavin uh, stain and then tried to wash them for about uh, 30 minutes again. So I was hoping that uh, I would see the nucleus because acriflavin will, uh, it's a basic dye, it will bind to the nucleus and I would see only the nucleus. So I washed it for 30 minutes, uh, hoping that all of the additional stains will go and only the nucleus will be stained. And after that, what I did was uh, I took our probe and I uh, gently touched that probe to the onion tissue. And I was hoping that uh, I would start seeing the nucleus of the of the uh, of the onion tissue. So when I switch on the scanning mode, uh, resume the laser, slowly start increasing the laser power, um, and I can see the onion tissue. But I was hoping to see only the nucleus. But instead of nucleus, I'm also seeing a lot of staining with the cell membrane. So I'm not sure whether plasma membrane has something that is binding with acriflavin or it is just cell wall that is working as a reservoir for acriflavin. But it is also giving equally bright fluorescence like that of the uh, nucleus. Now you can also select different aspect ratio uh, depending upon your requirement. So now I'm going deep into the tissue. I want to see what is the actual organization of the nucleus uh, inside the tissue. So you can see here at uh, 400 uh, or 500 uh, microvolt laser power, I'm getting really good saturation. And normally for animal tissues, you don't have to use uh, that much of higher laser power uh, because you will be getting really good uh, staining. Here the staining efficiency is uh, low. So then I can capture the image and I can store that images for uh, further analysis. Now, let me show you how uh, these images look. So this is one of the image uh, that I captured uh, while performing uh, this experiment. And this is full 475 by 475 uh, micrometer view. And if you zoom in, uh, you can basically see the nucleus uh, and how this nucleus is organized. Uh, initially, I was hoping I'll be seeing only nucleus and everything will be black but it turns out that cell wall is also capturing some amount of uh, 
this acriflavonate is giving fluorescence. And if you zoom into that nucleus, you also see some uh, light bodies. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's nucleolus uh, because as per the standard definition, it should be, uh, but it was a very vague uh, kitchen experiment. So I'm not sure whether it's nucleus or not, but it seems like that. Now, apart from this XY imaging, uh, we are also interested in performing some optical sectioning. So for optical sectioning, what you do is uh, you go to the Z stack region and then you define uh, your parameters, like at what imaging depth you want to start, what is the Z step you want to take? Like you can take three, four, five, so anything above three you can decide and you can go up till 400 micrometer. But because we are running short on time, uh, I'll perform very simple Z stack. So I'll start at zero. Uh, I'll take uh, five uh, micrometer uh, Z step and I'll stop at uh, about 40. So it should start, uh, it, it should take five uh, micrometer uh, optical section. So it starts at zero and it will start capturing the images at different interval. And this images will be stored on your computer. So this is this format is called as TIFF file format and it's compatible with uh, all the uh, image analysis softwares. Like if you are using ImageJ or if you are using Imaris or any other image analysis software that you are using. So it's compatible with all of them. So what we have done is uh, we have captured this image sequence and uh, it was taken into Imaris. So you can perform the analysis into Imaris and this is the result you get. Uh, you can understand the entire architecture of the tissue. And not only that, you can also understand the organization of the uh, cell wall and the nucleus with that. So instead of that, suppose you are having uh, the tissues like kidney, you will see the organization of the uh, nephrons. Suppose you are having a cancerous tissue and you are staining the blood vessels, you will see the organization of blood vessels inside that. And it's not just about uh, the beautiful imaging. Uh, Imaris also allows you to, uh, to understand the structures. For example, you can understand how the structures are organized, what is their volume, and how they are organized inside the, the orientation of that tissue. So, and in addition to that, you can also isolate the structures. For example, if you are a toxicologist and you are working for uh, nuclear studies and you want to understand if there is pycnosis, there is cell death, or there is necrosis, so you can use the softwares and understand them. So this analysis was uh, performed by Dr. Amanda from uh, Bitplane and we are thankful to her. Now, I used uh, acriflavin for two reasons. Uh, one, uh, it is uh, very economic, uh, it's not expensive. And second thing, it is also biosafe. So we do not have a dedicated uh, wet lab. So we have to use something that is biosafe, but you can use any dye you want. So I have listed some of them here. So you can use membrane dyes, uh, you can use any specific dyes. Uh, functional marker, pH markers, if you are working with GFP, YFP, that also works excellent with this instrument. So one thing that you have to understand is uh, this instrument completely depends upon uh, your staining protocol. So for example, uh, you can see two images here. So the left hand side image was uh, captured using the topical application of uh, acriflavin and it stains the nucleus. So you can see the very well organized uh, colonic mucosal architecture. The right hand side image was captured by injecting the animal with uh, fluorescent sodium. So this fluorescent will start leaching out into the mucosa. And what you see here is a, an image which is similar to this, but the resolution is not so well because the fluorescent is randomly leaching out. So depending upon your uh, fluorescent staining protocol, you will be getting different images. So you have to be a bit careful when you are deciding uh, what fluorophore you are using. But fluorescent works perfectly well for the vasculature studies. Now let's talk about uh, some of the applications of uh, this technology. For example, uh, we will discuss about cancer, vasculature, uh, skeletal and skin imaging. Uh, but before that, if you can allow me to understand uh, what are the animal models that you are working with, uh, so that based on that I can I can emphasize some of these applications. So if you can quickly answer uh, 
uh, some of this uh, models that you're working with? Okay, we are waiting for response from some people. Okay, so I'll have to emphasize on most of the applications because uh, it's a really varied crowd. So many of you are working with cancer, skeletal and gastrointestinal imaging. So I'll try and emphasize uh, uh, as much as possible. So thank you for answering. So the first application of this instrument is uh, you can perform virtual histology. So if you don't want to go for your classical tedious histology, what you can do is simply apply the fluorophore-like acriflavin and you will get the results. So here you can see the ectocervix. Uh, this is our classical hematoxylin eosin staining and you can see comparable results with uh, this 5-2. Uh, you can also perform the ex vivo imaging. So what you can do is uh, you can take out the tissue, apply some stain, and then see whether uh, you're getting the similar results. So this comparison was provided by Dr. Philip Curie. And as you can see, uh, the classical histology images of the breast tissue and comparable images with the uh, with the 5-2. Now with classical uh, histology, you will get just one section uh, and there is a probability of artifacts. While with this, you can perform optical section, you can perform 3D analysis, you can go for image analysis. So n number of possibilities uh, of image analysis. And it allows you to uh, go for higher impact factor papers because you are performing these advanced technology. So apart from those uh, simple imaging uh, techniques, you can also go for uh, functional imaging. And I would like to give the example of uh, Dr. Martin and his team from Germany. So they are working with thrombosis and what they wanted to do was they wanted to understand how the uh, blood clot is actually happening. So they isolated some blood cells from the mice and then they stained them with the, uh, with the FITC and then they injected uh, it back. So when they injected it back, you can see that uh, these blood cells are now circulating inside the um, blood vessels and you can see how they are organized. So very simple protocol and you can start seeing the blood vessels. Now, along with that, what they did was they injected the animal with acriflavin. And as we know, acriflavin, it will start staining the nucleus. So you can see that uh, all the arteries are getting stained because they are having that uh, smooth muscle cells and also notice the shape of the nucleus here. And after that, they introduce the thrombosis. So by introducing a mechanical uh, damage to the tissue, they introduced a thrombosis. And you can see this is an artery here. And you can also see uh, different cells which are coming up here. And most probably they are the uh, immunogenic cells and because they have uh, a nucleus while the red blood cells do not have one. So you can see uh, a thrombosis happening in this image. So depending upon your requirement, you can, uh, you can be creative and you can decide uh, different fluorescence staining protocols. And we have already discussed uh, this red brain, uh, red brain glioblastoma and I'm sure many of you have seen this image, uh, this video. So this type of uh, image sequence can also be captured with this tool. And especially you are a cancer biologist uh, and if you want to see what's happening to your uh, vasculature around the tumor, uh, this tool is uh, an excellent device. Uh, it works uh, equally well with the large animals. Uh, so what you can do is you can combine, uh, you can combine this probe with the uh, endoscope and you can topically apply the stain. Uh, like acriflavin was applied uh, to the dog's stomach and you can see the organization of the dog's stomach. If that animal is suffering from any disease, you can see the related alteration in the architecture. For example, if it is having ulcer or if it is having uh, any parasites, you will be able to see in that. Similarly, uh, you can also image the intestinal cells. Uh, so here uh, the intestinal cell, uh, the intestinal tissue was imaged ex vivo and they applied acriflavin and you can see the, the villi cell. So this is the topmost layer and you can see some cells are ejecting out of this uh, brush border and up to the extent you can see some of the cells which are undergoing division. 
So before that, it was not possible. You have to bring the animal uh, to the stage uh, for intravital imaging, or you have to take out the tissue and perform the sections for capturing such images. So this type of imaging is possible only with uh, fluorescence in vivo endomicroscopy. Now let's discuss the example of uh, vascular imaging. So we know that uh, compared to a normal tissue, uh, the vasculature in the tumorous tissue is uh, altered. Uh, and uh, so uh, Dr. Leem and his team, uh, they were working with uh, melanoma and associated microvasculature. Uh, so what they did was uh, they injected the normal murine with uh, FITC dextran. And what you can see is the circulation of this fluorophore inside the capillaries. So you can see uh, a very well organized capillary here and uh, there is no leaching of FITC. Now, when you have melanoma, in melanomic tissue, you can see that uh, the, the capillary innervation is really high. And apart from that, there is also leaching of FITC into the tissue. So if you see the tissue background here, it's dark. That means uh, FITC is not leaching. Uh, the, capillary, uh, the capillary structure is really tight. While here you can see the capillaries have dilated and the FITC is leaching out. And this is one of the phenomenon that will uh, contribute to the metastasis. So for cancer biologists, this is an important thing that they can understand from, uh, from this uh, studies and the five two technology allows you to do that and just like our uh, onion tissue you can perform the optical sectioning for uh, different types of tissues so here uh, they injected the uh, they tried to perform the imaging of uh, lymph vessel inside the adipose tissue so you can see different optical sections are captured and once you take those uh, optical sections into software like MRS, you can organize that entire structure. So for example, you can see the structure of uh, lymph vessel inside the adipose tissue. So similarly for your experiment, if you are working with blood vessels or if you are working with, uh, uh, with kidney cells or if you are working with any other tissue, you can basically capture such uh, optical sections and organize them into uh, functional videos like this. And uh, from publication point of view, you can submit them into accessory data, but these things uh, look really cool when you are going for a grand presentation or uh, you are publishing uh, or you are presenting your uh, ideas into a conference. Uh, this tool has uh, excellent application for tissue engineering. Uh, and one example I can cite here of uh, is of cartilage. So, Dr. Wu and his team, they were working with the cartilage tissue and what they have done was they simply applied the topical fluorescent to the cartilage and you can see the cartilage architecture here. <coughs> so in this space, you will have chondrocytes and the cartilage has absorbed the fluorescent. So you can see the cartilage architecture uh, from the live animals. And what you can do is uh, Suppose you want to understand how the regeneration is following into the tissue. So what Wu and his team did was uh, they were trying to understand the ACI uh, protocol. So that is autologous uh, cartilaginous implant. So what they do is uh, they create an artificial defect onto the uh, cartilage and then they implant the then they implant the autologous cartilage into that. And then they will try and see how that cartilage is growing and replenishing the damaged uh, cartilage. So similarly, you can also follow uh, your own studies of regeneration. For example, if there is a bone biologist and they want to understand how the bone is uh, uh, growing, uh, following, uh, following damage or following micro fractures. So you can use uh, similar protocols. One last example I want to discuss is about uh, a recent uh, communication from Professor Gracie and uh, Professor Gracie and her team. Uh, so she is working with the toxic effect of uh, HIV preventive agents. And what she knows, uh, what she already knew was uh, this agents are basically damaging the rectal mucosa. And she had no other way of capturing the images. Uh, she was working, working with uh, mostly the biochemical and other analysis. But once she explored this technology, uh, she used it uh, endoscopically to capture the images. So images A, B, C, and D, they are the normal images. So A and B, A, B, and C, they were captured with the acriflavin. So you can see the 
uh, the different cells and how they are organized. And image D was captured with the injection of FITC. So this FITC will start flowing into the blood vessels and it will give you the architecture of blood vessels. Now image E was the indication of uh, the toxic effect of the HIV preventive agent. And you can see that there is some damage to the mucosal tissue. But apart from that, the permeability of the uh, blood vessels has increased significantly. And because of that, FITC has started leaching out into the mucosa. Now this is uh, really troubling for the HIV preventive agents because then it will increase the susceptibility of the patient to the, or susceptibility of the user to the, uh, to the HIV like infections. And when she used the higher dosage, not only the mucosal barrier was compromised, she could also see the alteration in the uh, crypts of the, of the rectal tissue. So all these images were captured from live animals and it allows you to understand what is happening to your tissue in real time. Now let me discuss uh, the advantages of uh, this uh, fluorescence in vivo endomicroscopy. So laser confocal endomicroscopy, it's a broad terminology for any endo endomicroscopy technique that is using laser. But there are different technologies uh, available. And one of such technology is uh, bundle fiber technology. So what this bundle fiber technology does is it combines uh, many uh, micro optical fibers uh, into one. And then it is calculating whether it has received any light from that or not. And then it reconstructs the image. While compared to that, what five does is uh, it is scanning just like our co normal confocal laser scanning microscope. Then it offers you much better results uh, compared to the five, uh, the bundle fiber. So here is the comparison uh, of uh, these two technologies. Excuse. So here is the comparison of these two technologies. So the left image was captured from mouse colon, and you can see how pixelated the image is. And here the mouse colon, it was surgically exposed and then uh, the imaging was performed. And here you can see even the cellular structures. And if you zoom in, you can see there is no detail of the, uh, of the tissue. While the five is offering you subcellular resolution, you can see the nuclear, uh, the, the structure of the cells here. In addition to that, uh, because the, uh, the bundle fiber technology has a microfiber, uh, it is capturing a very small field of view and then you will have to rotate that entire uh, fiber onto the tissue and stitch the images together. While compared to that, uh, the view and vivo 5.2, uh, it gives you a 475 by 475 uh, micrometer large field of view and it gives you true images and all the structures in that entire image. Now, um, this technology lives on our planet, so it has also some limitations. So one of the limitation of this technology is uh, signal to noise ratio, like uh, classical confocal microscopy. Uh, if your samples are not stained properly, if your fluorophore is not having sufficient quantum yield, uh, you won't be obtaining uh, a very good signal to noise ratio. Now, benchtop confocal microscopes can compensate uh, by increasing the laser power. So they have um, <clears throat> higher laser power. Now, as this instrument is uh, an endoscope, uh, so it has to be kept uh, biosafe so that accidentally you don't expose yourself to the, to the harmful laser power. So that is the reason why it cannot compensate for the drop in signal to noise ratio if you're staining, uh, if your fluorophore is uh, not sufficiently distributed or it does not have, um, uh, it does not have higher quantum yield. Uh, now let's talk about uh, some of the troubleshooting. So one thing that uh, one can make a mistake is uh, you can use uh, high, you use higher laser power and you end up in uh, oversaturation. So what you can do is you can go to the to the scanning mode and you can switch from gray scan to high low scan, and then the instrument will start showing you which are the regions that are oversaturating. So then you can go back. Uh, you can decrease the laser power and you can reach an optimal level where there is uh, no high saturation. And then you can go back to the gray mode, uh, gray scan mode, and then you can capture the images. Sorry. Now, um, this instrument is uh, 
very easy to maintain so you don't have to worry about anything except uh, the probe so because you are using it endoscopically uh, there will be some blood clots onto that so we advise uh, cleaning the probe uh, once you have completed your imaging uh, clean it with the standard 75 percent alcohol so that it is also disinfected you can also use uh, lens cleaning solutions and any other um, microscope cleaning devices you have and you don't have to worry about the the biosafety of the laser because it's the 2r laser so it's completely biosafe uh, but don't stare at the laser for uh, longer time so you don't have to worry about anything now let's quickly summarize uh, what we have discussed so far so we started with uh, the fluorescence microscopy and how for many of the scientists uh, benchtop microscopy is not sufficient then we talked about the the fluorescence in vivo endo microscopy and how it is combining the two worlds of uh, benchtop microscopy and uh, in vivo imaging and uh, we talked about the end phase imaging with this uh, fluorescent vivo endo microscopy uh, we had a practical session where we tried and imaged the uh, the tissue uh, the onion cells and we also saw uh, the, what is the resolution of this uh, microscope then we talked about some of the applications uh, like cancer glioblastoma vasculature with melanoma gastrointestinal in uh, canine model then uh, cartilage tissue regeneration skin imaging uh, we also talked something about the bundle fiber technology and uh, five two and some of the safety features so this is uh, my understanding about the fluorescent in vivo endo microscopy and uh, now i'll hand over the stage for discussion to to the participants thank you very much thank you very much ayaz for that excellent presentation um and hopefully everyone found uh, that uh, very informative. We do have some time, as I as mentioned, to answer some uh, questions. Please do feel free still to submit any questions you have through the Q&A chat box, which is located, um, the icon is, at, uh, is on the bottom uh, ribbon of your uh, Zoom webinar interface. So as you mentioned that um, the system operates using a 488 nanometer laser. Um, how can one perform dual color imaging with this system if it only has one excitation laser? So the trick is in the, in the emission filter. So what you have to do is uh, you have to decide your fluorophores carefully. And uh, what you can do is uh, the instrument will excite both the fluorophores at the same time. Um, and what will happen is when the, the, when the fluorescence comes out, uh, you can use different filters. So for example, uh, one of your fluorophore is giving maximum fluorescence at, uh, uh, let's say, 540 nanometers, right? So then you use the, uh, use the filter according to that, and then you will try and filter out the fluorescence from the second fluorophore. Now you change the filter and you choose the second fluorophore that gives you fluorescence, uh, let's say about 580 or 590. And then you can decide, uh, then you can choose that second filter and then uh, the resulting fluorescence you collect. And then you can combine those two uh, with false imaging into image, uh, image analysis softwares. But you have to be very careful here if your uh, fluorophores are having spectral breeding. That means if it is giving really high fluorescence at uh, 5, uh, emitting very high fluorescence at 540, but it is also giving some partial fluorescence at 580, then there will be spectral bleeding. So you have to be a bit careful about uh, deciding the fluorophore. So it, it's always, uh, I mean, your protocol will be determining uh, if you can perform the multicolor imaging or not. Martin, you might have forgotten to unmute yourself. Okay, thanks, Ayaz, for that uh, that answer. Um, the there's a question here about the onion cells that you showed, um, and do you feel that they are too large? It seemed like they were 
somewhere in the order of 300 microns in size. Um, so when I captured these images for the first time, even I was uh, really puzzled, like why are the cells uh, seeming so large? And then I did some referencing and uh, onion cells are pretty large. They are about in the range of uh, 300 microns in size. So they are pretty large cells and the nucleus is also pretty large. So that is, that is what we observed here. Uh, I can also see one uh, interesting question here from uh, uh, Dr. Lehman. So can you see the blood flow? Um, of course, uh, we can amazingly see the capillaries and blood flow. So what you have to do is uh, you have to decide uh, uh, upon a fluorophore uh, that is injectable, normally uh, FITC dextran. So you can inject this uh, FITC dextran into the animal and the entire vasculature will lit up like uh, a Christmas tree. So this is something really cool application. So if, if you are interested, probably we can, we can plan for something like that. Perfect. Can you talk about um, whether there's any damage to the tissue? Um, with respect to placing the probe? Uh, no, I don't think uh, there will be any damage to the tissue because you just have to bring them in physical contact with each other. Uh, like you can see how I placed it on my finger. So it's not like it's gonna damage the tissue. It's just a very, uh, very simple uh, bringing them in contact with each other and then it will start performing the imaging. So there won't be any damage to the tissue. You don't have to worry about the damage. Okay. How does one know uh, what angle they're imaging at? So um, are they getting HS, LS, or TS? So when you are um, keeping uh, this probe, um, when you are bringing this probe in touch with the tissue, you have basically some idea of uh, what is the orientation of my probe. And a few things also come from experience. So when you are, you are working with animal models, you know which part of the tissue is present where and when you are putting down the probe you have an idea okay fine this is the part where i am in and this is the structure i would be seeing so you can start making it that out from the images that you capture and because this entire stage is designed in such a fashion fashion that uh, you can adjust your probe accordingly so if you are getting the images which are comparable to longitudinal section you can alter the alter the angle of attack of this probe and then you can capture the images as you wish. Okay, perfect. I'm just scanning through some of the questions here, so just bear with me a second. So we have some questions on pricing and also if it's possible to to try this technology on different models. Can you address mm -hmm. those questions? So I think pricing would be something uh, our sales team would know. So. I would recommend reaching out to the sales team. Uh, when it comes to the practical trial, uh, we do organize road shows. Uh, so we go and reach out to different labs and if they have any interesting protocols they want to try. So we send our instrument or we personally go there and we plan like two or three day trials and we perform some imaging experiments and see whether this tool can work for their images or not. So this is something we are always open to. And if you see there is a practical application of this tool and just like what I did with my onion cells, if you want to do with your rat cells or rat tissue or even large animals, we are always open. We, I'm, I mean, I'm very passionate about this technology. I always love seeing this instrument in action. And uh, definitely because I'm an animal biologist, uh, I always wanted to, uh, I always want to reach out to those people who are working with animal biology and try and see whether it can work or not. Great. Is there any limit to how large animals um, can be in order to use a tool like this, for example, horses and, and pigs? So, yeah, so our experience is uh, with the larger size, anim size animals, you get even better images. So especially those who are working with veterinary sciences uh, for horses, it, it has an excellent application. And one interesting example I can discuss from, uh, discuss from my recent experience is uh, uh, one of our collaborators in uh, Australia, they are trying to understand the equine fertility. So the fertility of the horses uh, for artificial uh, insemination. 
so they are trying to understand whether the female horses are reproductive so they will try and perform the imaging of uterus so they will insert uh, this probe with the with the endoscope into the uterus they will apply some acriflavin and they will, then they will image the the uterus and then they will uh, then they will inseminate the female and then they will try and understand whether the fertilization has happened or not and they have established a correlation so what is the architecture or what is the status of the female uterus and uh, how it looks and based on that they have established whether it will be successful or not so our experience is with larger animal uh, it gives better results because then the handling is very easy so if any one of uh, participants is interested uh, probably we can discuss that okay perfect you've you've talked about a lot of examples you've shown some data is there an opportunity to share the publications or references to those publications uh sorry can you repeat that sure um with the examples that you've discussed today and the data mm -hmm. that you've shown mm -hmm. can you share the publications that are related to those images yeah so so all of these publications they are listed on uh, our website for uh, at syntica so if you go to the Syntica uh, web pages and then you go to the uh, the Phyto Technology web page, uh, all the publications are listed there. And if anyone has still any questions regarding that, uh, they can definitely connect with me and I can answer their questions. Okay, perfect. And uh, I can see one interesting question here from, uh, I can't say the name, but um, it's about uh, Okay, it's three, four questions. So first is uh, how much is the speed of capturing? So you can go up to 3.5 frames for uh, uh, zero to 3.5 frames uh, per second. Uh, and um, does this technology have a filter for uh, sodium fluorescent? Yes, it does have. And what is the diameter of the probe? So it is about uh, four millimeter in diameter. And the last question from him is, uh, if the tip of the laser inside the brain becomes cloudy, does that mean that the images will not be clear? Uh, so cloudy in terms of uh, the fluid. So if the fluid is not uh, giving any fluorescence, it won't affect. But for example, you are giving sodium fluorescent and that sodium fluorescent starts leaching out into the material, uh, sorry, in, uh, into the, uh, around the probe. And then definitely that will give you some signal. So till the time your sodium fluorescence is inside the capillaries, we don't have to worry about anything. It will give you excellent images. But if you are giving for uh, going for topical application or if you are imaging any application where there will be a lot of uh, sodium fluorescence in between the capillary and the probe, then definitely uh, there will be some problem. Okay, thanks for answering that question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Keeping an eye on the time, there are some unanswered questions. Ayaz, are there any that jump out at you that maybe have been asked um, by more than one person that we want to quickly um, respond to? Or um, being um, uh, respectful, respectful of everyone's time, we have reached the, the one hour yeah. mark. Yeah. So maybe we'll wrap things up. Mm -hmm. And as mentioned at the start of this webinar, we will be uh, answering any outstanding questions privately and we'll also publish a written transcript of all the questions and answers from this Q&A session. So I'd like to thank our presenter Ayaz Rangres for his insightful presentation and practical demonstration of the 5-2 laser confocal endomicroscope system. Uh, thank you, Ayaz. And thank you, everyone. Yeah, please reach out to us with any questions related to this technology that we highlighted today. Uh, we'd be more than happy to discuss your application and how the 5-2 system can support your research. So thanks again to all of you for attending our webinar today. We look forward to seeing you at a future Syntica event and have a great day. Thank you everyone. Thanks for joining.